portals to the unknown. Whether discovered in space at the center of a black hole, or created in a futuristic laboratory by bespectacled engineers, portals are a solid staple of science fiction. They are often depicted as energetic rifts in space-time shining with an ethereal glow, unmistakable as something unnatural, or at the very least, extraordinarily rare. As to where these mysterious disturbances in the universe may lead were one to step through, the possibilities are as endless as space and time. In both science fiction and fantasy, portals are used as a means to instantly travel between two usually faraway points. They are the ultimate convenience, reducing the effort of a long journey to the simple act of stepping through a gate. Just as important as their utility is the wonder associated with stepping into an unknown world. The portal fiction is a mainstay in storytelling for those who wish to escape to another reality. Portals are among the most common devices depicted in all corners of adventure fiction. However, one might not expect that portals are also observed scientifically, closer to home, and with more frequency than one might ever imagine. A portal, contrary to the idea of the word in popular culture, is a remarkably simple thing. It is an opening or entrance, particularly a large or imposing one. The scientific definition is no different, despite again the flair attached to the word. In that way, portals can be any door in any structure. The closest thing to the portals of science fiction, however, are opening and closing just a few tens of thousands of miles above the surface of the Earth, roughly every eight minutes. These portals, however, cannot transport you to a faraway place. They can only allow the passage of high-energy particles from the sun. Not portal fiction. This is a story of portal fact. Flux transfer events. Magnetic portals to the sun. The Earth's magnetic field is generated by its iron core. Convection creates electric charges in alloys found in the core, and like a complex dynamo, the motions of the core generate the field. This field interacts with charged particles from the sun, and where this interaction occurs is called the magnetosphere. Earth's magnetic field extends many miles into space. On the night side of the planet, it extends 3,900,000 miles or greater, this long extension being called the magnetotail. Opposite the magnetotail is the magnetopause, the area on the day side of the planet where Earth's magnetic field is compressed by solar wind. In the magnetopause, the field is compressed down to 40,000 miles. The shape and size of the magnetopause vary with solar intensity. Earth's magnetosphere contains magnetized plasma, and so does the solar wind which pushes against it. The convergence of the plasma from the solar wind and the plasma from the magnetosphere make the structure of the magnetopause highly complex, depending on many variables that can fluctuate wildly. This structure depends on the Mach number, a ratio of flow velocity to the local speed of sound, and beta, a ratio of plasma pressure to magnetic pressure of the plasmas found at the convergence, and is also influenced by Earth's magnetic field. It is at this chaotic convergence of the magnetopause and the solar wind that these strange, often misunderstood portals are found. Before 2007, not many scientists believed that this phenomenon occurred. As far back as the 1720s, fluctuations in the magnetic field were documented at the poles during the times when auroras flared up. Anders Celsius spoke of this in his 1730 publication, New Method for Determining the Distance from the Earth to the Sun noting that when the aurora borealis was active, strong deflections in the needle of his compass were observed. Later in 1733 he would publish more observations, 316 of them, made in the early part of the century. In 1908, a Norwegian scientist named Christian Birkeland made similar but more detailed observations in his book The Norwegian Aurora Polaris Expedition. Birkeland proposed that there were polar electromagnetic currents emanating from the Earth flowing along the lines of the Earth's electromagnetic field. He then suggested that high-energy particles emitted from sunspots were diverted by the magnetic field to the poles, where they produced the auroras. This theory was supported by experimental evidence. Birkeland had used cathode ray tubes to point a beam of electrons toward a small magnetic representation of the Earth, and he found that the electrons were always diverted to the poles, where they would produce curious rings of light. Despite how sound Birkeland's research was, at the time, he was ridiculed for his theory. It wasn't until 1967 that his theory was confirmed, 
after the U.S. Navy satellite 1963-38C used a magnetometer in the ionosphere to detect magnetic disturbances. Disturbances were observed whenever the satellite passed over the regions of the Earth that were polar. The magnetic disturbances were later determined to be caused by the field-aligned electric currents that Birkeland had predicted. And so now they are called Birkeland Currents. Even with research on the Birkeland Currents and the magnetopause continuing into the millennium, scientists believe that the connection between Earth's magnetosphere and the Sun was permanent, and that particles from the solar wind could freely diffuse into the ionosphere. Data would later begin to suggest that particles from the solar wind flowed into the magnetosphere during flux transfer events, or magnetic reconnections, and that the Earth and Sun's magnetic fields only joined briefly during these transfers. It wasn't until 2007 when a NASA satellite constellation called Temis was launched that scientists began to question the nature of the Sun's connection to the Earth. Temis stands for the Time History of Events and Macroscale Interactions During Substorms. The satellites contained electric field instruments for sensing the electric field in Earth's magnetosphere. They contained fluxgate magnetometers for measuring the background magnetic field. This was used to detect magnetic flux where the magnetosphere is reshaped during transfer events. These, among solid-state telescopes and electrostatic analyzers, made up the satellite instrumentation of Temis. There were also 20 stations on the ground in North America which contained sky imagers and even more magnetometers for detecting and observing auroras. During Temis's first year in operation, the satellite constellation made its way from the magnetopause to the magnetotail, observing magnetic fluctuations and the auroras as they occurred. That year, it was announced that NASA had discovered evidence of what were then described as magnetic ropes connecting the upper atmosphere directly to the sun. These ropes then being identified as Birkeland currents. Direct electrostatic interaction between the sun and the earth were once again confirmed, and these were the best observations of flux transfer events to date at the time. Data collected by Temis and also Cluster, a similar constellation of satellites launched by the ESA, were used to reconstruct the interactions between the magnetopause and the solar wind, and it was found that during flux transfer events, the magnetosphere of the Earth and the magnetic field of the Sun briefly join, creating a portal shaped like a cylinder and roughly the diameter of the Earth, through which charged particles from the solar wind can flow. This magnetic reconnection was found to be the trigger for the auroras observed at the poles. Years later, in 2015, NASA launched its Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission, or MMS, another multi-satellite program. This mission contained one less satellite than Temis, but its instruments were more uniquely suited to observe magnetic reconnection, and in 2016 it was the first to directly detect the phenomena. It is now generally accepted that these reconnections occur roughly every eight minutes on average. The terminology associated with magnetic reconnection and flux transfer events may mislead one into thinking that they are some cutting-edge breakthrough into the travel technology of the future. The word portal was used to sensationalize headlines and video titles, often mistakenly or intentionally missing the mark and painting these magnetic channels as fantastical gateways to the unknown, like black holes appearing in the magnetosphere. Driving these misunderstandings was the complexity of magnetic field and plasma interactions at these zones of magnetic convergence. The tendency of non-scholarly articles to summarize without fully researching NASA's findings was inevitable. After all, one could scarcely imagine a journalist passing up the viewer traffic that would be generated by an article titled, NASA confirms the presence of mysterious portals opening and closing above the Earth. The truth of the matter, however, is that the discoveries of MMS and Temis have confirmed and elaborated upon ideas about Earth's electromagnetic field and auroras that were touched on as far back as the 1700s, and further examined and analyzed by Christian Birkeland in the early 1900s. It has been established that portals allowing energetic solar particles to enter Earth's magnetosphere are not a permanent fixture, but open and close with relative frequency and cause auroras to manifest. Does this research bring humanity any closer to instantaneous travel between points via portal? Most likely not. Perhaps if travel portals of the future utilize interacting magnetic fields and charged particles, the science of flux transfer events and magnetic reconvergence will be of use. 
However, for now, it is acceptable that this research explains the very complicated nature of electromagnetic interaction between the Earth and the Sun, and also solidifies a long-suspected cause for the spectacular lights observed in the sky above the poles. Sometimes, a portal is just a door, and that's all it needs to be. Thank you for watching and listening. If you like this video and you'd like to see more like it, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Sharing my content on social media is also a tremendously good way to support the channel. And if you'd like to support the channel in a more direct way, feel free to donate via Patreon or pick up some Phobos Media merchandise at my represent.com merch store. Links as always will be in the description down below.